Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for having me. Um, and please ask lots of questions in, 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 in any time. Um, so I'm going to tell you about uh, our effort, the University of Sussex, of actually constructing a, a graphene quantum uh, computer. Right. So, so before I start, let me do the most important thing first, and that is give credit to, to my team at the University of Sussex, uh, who's actually helping to make all of this happen. And, and Seb Veit, who sits right here, he's, he's our senior scientist in the group. So, so any questions uh, to look after the talk as well. And I should obviously uh, acknowledge our funding agencies uh, uh, who actually make all of this possible. Right. Um, so let me just start by, by, by giving you some background, and let's start by just uh, how do you actually trap a line? And, and, and unfortunately, I think an electric field minimum is illegal in all countries uh, due to some uh, uh, bad, bad physics laws. So we're going to have to trick the system, and uh, the, what we do is we have this kind of oscillating potential, and that really doesn't look like um, um, it can trap, so as an experimentalist, obviously, we, we, we don't want to solve the equations and instead uh, have an old record player which uh, we attach a saddle onto. And now you can see that the motor didn't quite work so well, it's better help a little bit. Um, so you can see now as we, we place the ion, the big ion, onto our spinning saddle, that indeed the spinning saddle can actually trap. So, <clears throat> so this is. Uh, the principle of an ion trap now just replace the spinning mechanical potential with a spinning electric potential, and now you can see how you can trap an ion. Now this is our qubit here, a very very simple simple qubit. Uh, it's a hyperfine qubit in, in ytterbium. So these are these are the two qubit states here. And now if I want to detect the qubit, all what I do is I I I, I place a, a resonant laser beam onto this transition, and what happens is. If the ion is now in the in the zero qubit state, uh, if I look at the probability of emitting photons, uh, now that probability is, is, is pretty much very high uh, of emitting no photons because this laser beam is not resonant. But if I am now in the other qubit state, uh, I have a large probability of emitting photons. And by now comparing these two histograms, I can I can now. Uh, uh, calculate the, the detection fidelity and, and by just increasing the size of the imaging lens it is possible to get uh, detection fidelities of, of 99.9%. So <coughs> trap lines and uh, one of the leading, maybe one of the two leading implementations to build a quantum computer um, so there's been a very very impressive progress around the world uh, in, in making Trap ions, uh, a very, very powerful physical platform to build quantum computers. So these are just some examples of people have entangled up to 14 qubits if they have uh, entangled photons and, and, and with ions of photons, the teleportation, uh, the quantum algorithm, uh, quantum gates have been implemented with 99.9% .9 fidelity, so, so well above the fault tolerant threshold, and also very, various algorithms have, have been implemented. So, so if you want to uh, drive an entanglement gate with, with trapped ions, a traditional way to do that is using laser beams. And so, so you need a state-dependent force, and you can make the state-dependent force using, using two laser beams, and, and, and by basically utilizing the momentum within uh, the photons, you can now uh, drive what we call a stimulated Raman transition, and therefore give the ions a kick, which is in a way the ingredient to, to make an entanglement gate. Now, a lot of fantastic work has been done in trapped ions, but 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 some of the re we still write eight or ten or fifteen qubits. And, and beautiful talk by um, two speakers this morning um, show us like this fantastic problems, but you're going to need a, a large number of qubits. How many qubits do we need? Maybe millions, maybe billions. If you want to factorize a two thousand bit number, you're going to need uh, unless you have an unbelievably awesome uh, fatalities and all your operations, you may need billions of qubits. So how are you going to go about uh, making billions of or millions of pairs of laser beams in your quantum computer? That engineering is absolutely possible. So don't think it's not possible, but it's going to be very, very hard. And, and so in my group at Sussex, we've been thinking about this for a long time and asked the question, is there a way uh, how we can simplify uh, some of the engineering to a degree where it might 
seem plausible to actually build a large-scale machine. And so, and so we've been focusing on, on the idea of microwave gates with trapped ions. And, and a long, long time ago, in 2001, actually Christoph Wunderlich um, was the, the person who actually first proposed the idea to use microwaves instead of lasers to, to uh, make quantum gates. And there's two schemes out there to do this. One, uh, which is the st uh, use a static magnetic field gradients with an external microwave source. And there's another scheme using oscillating magnetic field gradients where the microwaves are actually applied to the trapping electrodes. So this, <coughs> the, the earlier scheme was, is the, the precursor has been first demonstrated also by Christoph Wunderlich. The second scheme has been, been first demonstrated by the NIST group and is, is, is now implemented by, at, at Oxford. I'm going to focus in my entire talk uh, only about the, on, on to this scheme, and there's a good reason for that, and I'm going to sh show this uh, once I've explained to you how this works. So, so now first of all, let me compare, just give you some kind of motivation why we're doing this. If you, if you use lasers, you have something that's called off resonance scattering, so that's unavoidable when you use lasers. You're going to have to first of all align your early laser beams, you're going to have to deal with amplitude and phase fluctuations of, 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 your, of the light, of the, of the lasers, and, and really you're going to have to have all these mirrors and optical elements in order to build a large scale device. And there are MEMS mirror arrays and all these kind of things available, but it's still, it's still going to be a very messy engineering. Now, <clears throat> the reason why I'm why so excited by, by, by this idea is because you're going to have one, a horn, one emitter outside your entire quantum computer potentially, or a number of emitters, and that's all you need. Um, this is all electronics, it's, it's the same electronics as if you have in your mobile phone, um, so it's, it's, the technology has been unbelievably matured, and, and you can even do single ion addressing uh, unbelievably well, I'm going to show you in a second how well we can do that. So let me, let me first start by telling you the principle. The problem with microwaves is that microwave photons unfortunately don't have any momentum. And so this is in a way why many of the big groups around the world didn't pay much attention um, to, to developing this field and, and literally for many, many years Christoph Wunderlich in, in, in Germany was the only person who was investigated this. But here's the little trick you play. So you put your ion into a magnetic field gradient and so if, if the ions are in a magnetic field gradient then uh, one state may feel a force in that magnetic field gradient and the other state does not feel a force in this magnetic field gradient. Now when you use microwaves to change the state from here to here, then not the microwaves give the kick, but the actual force because the ion is now in a static magnetic field gradient. And this is the very principle of, of, of microwave quantum logic. Now we have a problem. The problem is this. Now if, if I use states where one feels a force and one doesn't feel a force, um, <coughs> then you're going to have to use a, we call a Zeeman state and one which actually is subject to magnetic field fluctuations. And experimentally, we'll always have fluctuating magnetic fields around. It's very hard to get rid of them or to shield them all the way. So this is rather flopping between two states which don't, uh, which would not be compatible with this scheme. And you can see beautiful, nice Rabi flopping here. Now, if you're gonna look at these, the uh, Rabi flopping here, you can see that decays very quickly. And so again, this has been a reason why, even once the idea were known, people didn't really pursue it as much because uh, they felt, look, how can we make a fantastic entanglement gate if, if, if we get so much decoherence on such a short time scale. <coughs> now, <coughs> Martin Plenio and others, so Martin actually has been an absolute star because he came up with this idea of uh, utilizing dressed states. So what, what are dressed states? So now this is the ground state of a turbine. So what we do is we apply two microwave fields. These two microwave fields here, and now we go into the interaction picture, and we get a new set of states in the interaction picture. So first of all, we get, and let's, let's not worry about all of them, let's just focus on this D state. But the D state is a superposition of minus one and plus one, and the two microwave fields. Now, this D state, what the magic about this D state is that this new state is actually highly resilient to magnetic field fluctuations, but it can be used for this quantum gate scheme using microwaves. And um, so this is, this is the paper where this first, was first proposed. In fact, I think there was an earlier paper as well where, where the idea of dress states was, was, was mentioned before. Now, we got really interested in this, and, but one of the things is 
um, um, it seemed very complicated to manipulate these states. And so we developed a new method, a very simple method, where you only, okay, sorry, I should say now we have now two, we have now a new qubit. So that the new qubit is, is, is the zero prime, which is still the, the standard atomic state, which doesn't, doesn't fluctuate in magnetic field fluctuation in this D state. So that's our qubit. Now, what you can see, like, if I, if I take my D state, which is the superposition of minus one and plus one, how am I going to go now between zero prime and this D state? And usually what you have to do is you have to have two fields here, right? You have to couple zero prime to plus one, zero prime to minus one. That's very messy. And so what we developed here is a new method. We've we, we shown this in this paper, if you're interested, to look at the details where we show you just need a single RF field, and now we can actually couple these two states. It's a very, very simple way to, to, to do this. But one of the things I want you to, to see as well, uh, or look at this here as well, is that now we can actually tune the separation of our qubit. Even for it's a clock qubit. Because a clock qubits usually mean like, you know, maybe the magnetic field doesn't do anything today. But here in this qubit, we can actually now tune the separation. And that will become very important later in, 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 in my talk. So here are the experimental results. So what you see here is we're hardly flopping between zero prime and D state. So this is only a qubit. You can see now, this is beautiful, beautiful Rabi flopping. And after 4,000 microseconds, you still don't see much, or don't see any decoherence. In fact, we've managed to increase the decoherence time by three orders of magnitude. Now, let me show you a, a first very, very simple experimental setup. So what you see here is a, a macroscopic trap. You see here two permanent magnets. Um, now, these permanent magnets produce a magnetic field gradient right here in the center where the ions are located. And this is exactly the gradient we're going to use to, to do our entanglement gates. But I'm going to show you now something else, individual addressing. Now, if you have laser gates, imagine you're going to have to focus your laser beams uh, with 10 micron accuracy onto your ion. And since your second ion might only be 5 microns next to that first ion, it's going to be very hard to make sure you only interact with ion 1, but not with ion 2. Now, let's do this the microwave way. Um, so, have a look at this, this level diagram here. And so what we're doing now, we, 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 we change the frequency of this R field here. We just tune the frequency of this field here. And as we do that, we can now either interact with ion 1 or with ion 2. Now, these two ions are in the magnetic field gradient. Since, that, since now the, the splitting varies because there's a magnetic field gradient, we can per, when we get a cost talk of 10 to the minus 8. So, uh, you know, so this, is, this, is, this is well, well beyond what we actually need. And, it, it's, and I can tell you all we do is we turn a knob instead of uh, aligning laser beams. So this is not a way in how you bring electronics into building a quantum computer, you go away from aligning laser beams. So first step, the next thing we need to show now is that we can actually drive motion, that we can give the ion a kick. And so this is what you see here, so now we have got our um, um, dress ion here again with these two dressing fields. And now if we detune the RF field from resonance to by the secular frequency, we can drive what's called the red sideband, you know, or if you tune it in the other direction, you can drive what's called the blue sideband. That, that means add uh, a, a quantum of momentum, add a phonon to the system. And so as an application of this, we managed to, uh, to do ground state cooling. So traditionally, people use, again, Raman laser beams to ground state cool ions. And I have to mention, actually, for quantum computing, that is not even that useful because we don't want to have to subscribe on state cool, but it's great for quantum simulation. It's a fantastic demonstration how powerful this, this idea really is. So using, using, this, um, <coughs> using this method, we've now managed to ground state cool ions using microwaves. Let's move on. Let's actually do a gate. So if we want to do a gate, we need two ions. We need a two-ion gate. So we have these two microwave fields here. Uh, they a slightly different frequency because now we have a magnetic field gradient. So, so we need these dressing fields, so we get our new qubit state. Now we're going to also need a red and a blue sideband. Now Molman and Sorensen have invented, and also Jared Milman together at the same time, invented this fantastic quantum gate. The great thing about this quantum gate is that you can actually do it with warm ions. So that means you don't need a ground state cool anymore, but you can actually now make uh, trap ion gates using ions which are not cool to the ground state, which are relatively warm. The method is you need a red and a blue sideband, and that's what we have here. And now this uh, should allow to make a gate. Let's, oops, let's look at the result. Now here are the populations. So we were producing this maximally entangled bell state. Um, <coughs> so, 
So we, we, uh, we, we perform a quantum gate, uh, we produce this maximally entangled uh, phase gate. Now let's look at the populations, and you can see that populations nicely match this state. Now that is not a proof that we have an entangled state, it may also be just a nice mixed state. In order to verify that you have an entangled state, you, know, you, look, you need to look at the off diagonal elements of the density matrix. So in order to get that, we plot the, the parity, um, and we do this here, and now looking at the amplitude of the parity, you can now, along with the population, say, and calculate the fidelity of the state, and we get around 98.5% uh, uh, entanglement fidelity. So, before I show you how we're gonna, uh, how this entanglement fidelity can be easily increased, let me, I want to show you a little bit why this, why we feel this is, this is really exciting. So tradition, this is kind of what like strong fields, you can hardly see this here, unfortunately, um, you can, how a quantum algorithm and a track ion quantum computer would, would look like, and you basically have little balls going around like a nice game of Pac-Man. In fact, like you're gonna, any quantum computer you're gonna envision is gonna have a, some memory regions, some entanglement regions, and they're gonna be periodically placed across your quantum computer. So what does it actually mean for a large scale quantum computer? That means that the number of, of fields to make quantum gates scales with the number of qubits in your system. So that's a very important thing to consider. It doesn't matter if you, if you just do a 14 qubit entangled state, then you don't really care about this, but when you want to build a quantum computer with 2 billion qubits, you're going to have to think about this very carefully, because that might mean you need 2 billion laser beams, or it mean, means you need 2 billion microwave sources, which which I'm sure the key side would like us to buy two million sources <laughs> like this, but, but, but let's try to come up with a more economic solution. <clears throat> and this is what I'm going to show you here. So this is kind of a, a very, very rough drawing of a large-scale quantum computer. What you see here is an array of X junctions. And now what I'm going to do now, I'm going to, I'm going to show you, a plot. I'm looking along this axis, and I'm going to plot the magnetic field along that axis. As so you can see, like in these entanglement, I've got these entanglement regions, and then I've got, a, I've got this steep magnetic field gradient. Right. <coughs> and in trap ion, when you trap ions, you can use voltages, you can control the, uh, with the voltage, the position of the trap ion. So now what I'm going to do is, and I'm looking, I'm looking in this zone here, so I'm going to now apply a voltage V1 that's going to place the ion in position Z1. <coughs> And if the, if the ion is in position Z1, since there's a magnetic field gradient, the ion is going to feel magnetic field B1. If the ion feels magnetic field B1 because of the Zeeman effect, because the splitting of our qubit is now tunable, um, I'm going to have this splitting. Now, this splitting is unfortunately off resonant with all the microwaves in my quantum computer, which I irradiate everywhere in my quantum computer, so the ion is doing exactly nothing. Now, I'm going to apply in this region the voltage V2. If I apply voltage V2, then my ion is going to be in position Z2. If my ion is in position Z2, then it's going to feel magnetic field B2. And if the ion feels magnetic field B2, then the splitting is different. Now suddenly the ion can feel the green microwave fields, which go everywhere in my quantum computer. And what, that, what does that mean? Well, the ion undergoes a single qubit gate. <coughs> now I'm going to apply voltage V3 in this region that pushes the ion in position Z3, well, now I'm going to use two ions, you're going to have two ions in position Z3, that changes the splitting again, now suddenly my, my, my two ions are going to be resonant to, to the red fields, and the red fields can now give rise to a two qubit gate. What does it mean? It means now that we can, just by turning on a voltage, we can actually execute a, a, a quantum gate. In fact, we can now build a large scale quantum computer where we literally just apply voltages to electrodes and by doing so, uh, execute gates. Now you can see now we do all the individual addressing using a voltage. We don't have to align laser beams anymore. We don't need two billion laser beams aligned anymore in our quantum computer. Literally all what we do is we apply voltages. <coughs> and this remind, might remind you of something and this is really a classical computer processor where you have lots of gates and you apply voltages and have currents and so on. So you can see uh, this uh, solution drastically simplifies uh, our uh, way to build a quantum computer. Now, um, fast and furious, we need to be that because you know if, if we if 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 we want want to 
use actually his ideas, for example, to do, you know, then we still need a reasonable clock speed. So <clears throat> how are we going to make these gates fast and how are we going to raise this fidelity up? So one simple way in this experiment we carried out is you just take these magnets from 6 millimeter distance to the ions to 2.4 millimeters to the ions. And you're going to increase the gradient. If you increase the gradient, then the gate's going to be faster, the fidelity is going to be higher. Now, <clears throat> that is not a good idea to do because this is a very simple experiment and as such it's not really useful to build a quantum computer. So instead, what you should really do is use microchips. This is something we do in my, my group. I've been developed for many, many years very, very sophisticated, sophisticated microchips. Now what you see here is, is a cross, uh, a cut through this, to this chip, and now instead of using permanent magnets, we have current carrying wires below the surface. Now these current carrying wires allow us to generate above the surface of the chip a very, very strong magnetic field gradient. In fact, we are able to, we already, with our old experiment, we held world record is with 24 tesla per meter. Now we have a solution which allows us up to 150 tesla per meter. And that then will bring us easily to 99.9 .9 or even higher fidelities. So, so it also will allow us to increase gate speeds by, by one, two or orders of magnitude. This is exactly where we need to be. This is, a, this is actually a picture of a microchip we have produced. Where you can see the, you can't really see this because the detection is not so great, but there's actually, you can barely see a current current wire below the surface. You can see that because when we, when we uh, uh, basically flatten the surface, then, then the, the, the side, you can still uh, see nanometer size variations and that actually allows you to see the wire below the surface. So <clears throat> how do you now go about of building a, a large scale uh, quantum computer? And so with all these ingredients we feel we've, we've, we've got, we have now a, a, at least a starting point, an engineering solution of how such a device could be built. So we start with an, with an X junction, that's kind of our smallest element in the quantum computer, where you have an entanglement zone. Remember, using current carrying wires below the surface, you can now entangle these two ions above the surface or make single qubit gates by the application of voltages to these electrodes. You have a loading zone, so you shoot a beam of neutral atoms through this, through a little tube up, and so you can load new ions in case you lose some, you always lose some, so you have to be able to reload. And you have a detection zone. Now you don't want to have a big imaging tube going somewhere in a big CCD camera anymore. Um, you want to be able to have a detector <laughs> integrated in the architecture, and that is what we've shown here. So <clears throat> now uh, this is actually a picture of a microchip we've produced in my group. So you can see this, this is, is not really so hard to achieve. Um, the, the segmented electrodes here, the RF electrodes and, and so on. Uh, some of the features are missing, which we're developing right now for the integrated detector. But you can see that, that you know this this is kind of technology which is which is well developed. Now this this is a picture uh, below the, the the chip surface. You can see how these current carrying wires are distributed. So the current carrying wires are below, below the electrode level. This is what, what what is possible with this with this fabrication process we've we've developed at, at Sussex. Um, if you want to build a large scale quantum computer, you cannot um, connect your electrodes here on the side. You're going to have to connect them on the back side. So we amended the process to have connections to the back side of, of this microchip. And you can see that in that picture here. Now, <clears throat> you, need, you need a detector. And it turns out it's actually best for us, and not for, not for quantum reasons, not for trap ion reasons, but actually for very, very classical electronic reasons to cool um, <clears throat> these modules to around 50 Kelvin, so using uh, liquid, uh, uh, helium gas or liquid nitrogen, you can actually cool this to around 50 Kelvin. Then you have the avail availability of these detectors. In fact, this has been a joint project with Bristol with one of the PhD students to, to verify that, that these detectors uh, work reasonably well and we were, and in, indeed, like in the dark round reduction around 10 to the, 10 to the 5 at 77 Kelvin. Great. Um, so these are in fact better than PMTs, but fit into the chip. So this is how, how, how in fact such a chip would look like. Um, you're going to have detectors integrated, you have electronics, so you have the digital to analog converters, you have FPGAs or ASIC electronics in there in order to generate all the, all the voltages, because you need to really do the scalable. If you want to build more and more modules, you can't just have a big fat computer somewhere which makes all the voltages, you're going to have to do this and on the actual module in order to really go to arbitrary sizes. 
So how do you make a trapped iron quantum computer modular? Now, now, you'll always have somebody coming and say, okay, I can build a large scale quantum computer with a thousand qubits on one wafer maybe, but then some HP is gonna come and say, look, I'm gonna have this really great algorithm which with 1,500 qubits, so I'm gonna be screwed. So, so that's really a fundamental thing about a quantum computer. It needs to be modular in such a way that you can have arbitrary, arbitrary module, uh, many modules. One of the ways to do this is, is, is this famous approach uh, um, <coughs> termed by, by the Oxford group uh, of the 2020 a engine, where you have individual modules which are connected using photonic interconnects. It's a very beautiful idea, but it's very hard because it's so hard because you're going to have to entangle um, this module with this module via photons. And the world record right now lies at around 7 hertz to do that. So while, you know, we, th this is not going to be very helpful in clock speeds if you start with the element with 7 hertz. It's very good ways to increase this, and the Oxford guys work very hard in order to make this happen. And I have no doubt eventually this will happen. But we decided at Sussex we want to go a much, much easier approach. So what we use is electric fields. Um, it's much simpler engineering, and you get very, very unbelievably high connection speeds between extra modules. So this is what I'm showing you here. You have a module here, you have a module here. Now you can shape the electrodes on the edge of each module in such a way that the barrier between, the energetic barrier is extremely small, so you can actually transport a line from one module to another module. This is how the module will then look like. So you have the um, uh, electronics on the back side, back side um, microchannel coolers to take all the heat away from all the electronics that are sitting on the back side. You keep the device around 50 to 60 Kelvin. Um, you have piezoelectric transducers which allow you to then move the modules with respect to each other in order to, to um, align them. You need to have an alignment of around 10 micrometers in order for, for the barrier to be reasonably small for, 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 for this to work. This is how, how, how we then go about and steal credit card details. So this is, our, uh, as, as I think nature termed it as a, a physicist proposed a football pitch size device. So this is going to be pretty big. Not, this is not going to be small, but it's doable. That's kind of the, we, we'd be able to shrink this by lots and lots of ways, but we didn't want to say, okay, if we invent this, we're going to maybe be able to do this. If you really want to, to have a two billion qubit device or billion, millions or billions of qubits, it's going to be pretty substantial than the artist's view is here. You have an error correction scheme, so we use a surface code for error correction. Um, have a look in this paper, because I'm running out of time, so I can't really explain it, all what's going on here. But basically, you use measure qubits and data qubits, and these measure qubits allow us to determine whether the error has occurred in the computation. And the uh, Austin Fowler has helped us, uh, from Google has helped us develop this and, and, and uh, for, for this implementation. <coughs> Um, and so the threshold is fairly low, is 99%. So this is a little film just to bring everything together. Um, so you start here, loading zone. Um, <clears throat> now you load two ions, one and another. The quantum ion is sympathetic cooled ion, so you can keep these ions cool without laser cooling. You bring them into an entanglement zone. You use global fields and these current carrying wires below the surface um, to entangle by the application of a voltage to, the, to this microchip. Um, once you've um, carried out the entanglement operation, the ions can, can now be transported, say, <clears throat> to the next zone, for example, to a detection zone. In the detection zone, you have this integrated photodetector, um, which allows you then to measure the quantum state. You have a global laser beam. You don't need to align this very carefully. It just goes more or less across the whole architecture, obviously limited by the Rayleigh range of the beam. You might have to bring in some optics to bring them in and out, but it can go over multiple, many, many, uh, <coughs> detection zones, then this is going to look like a nice game of Pac-Man and just <coughs> all, all these things go on in parallel. And uh, um, you can you do this on one big wafer, you pick whatever wafer size you have, that sets the size of the module. Now on the back of the module have all the electronics attached, um, you have cooling in order to get rid of the heat of all the classical electronics being used there. Um, you place one of, one of these modules onto a frame, you add a second module, and then either you use interferometric alignment methods and possibly piezoelectric transducer, as is shown here, you make sure that these modules are separated with an accuracy of around 10 micrometers. Um, so you can see that there, so if they're misaligned, the modules, the electric fields, the lines don't connect in such a way that you can shuttle. Now, if you align them by 10 micron accuracy, you can now transport ions to the next module. Now, that gives an increase 
of speed in connection of modules by 100,000. So, you know, five orders of magnitude. That, that's very impressive. And the engineering is unbelievably much simpler than, it, say, if you were to use photonic interconnects. And then <coughs> you pick the size of a problem and you're going to add as many modules as you can afford or need um, and s put together a quantum computer in, in, in this fashion. Obviously, you can see a lot of these things are artist suppressions. There's lots and lots of problems uh, you need to solve, and it's going to be unbelievably expensive. You're going to need cooling like mad. So, so this is by no means trivial to build such a machine. Uh, it's unbelievably hard, but we feel uh, we've, we've taken two very, very significant problems out of the equation. First problem is, is the fact that you would need millions of billions of laser beams unbelievably well aligned where any phase fluctuation would kill you. Uh, and replace them that voltage applied to a microchip. Other thing we've taken out of the equation is, is, is the complication of having photonic interconnects to replace them with an electric field connections. And so this, I think, uh, uh, has, should have strong impact on making a quantum computer. Right, so with this, um, I finish. I hope I've convinced you that, that by no means should you think building a quantum computer is easy. However, I think hopefully maybe maybe it convinced you we made it a little bit easier. So thank you very much. Questions? Yes. Thank you, Lenny, for a very very good talk. Um, I want to ask you two questions. So you mentioned that this system is is a warm system, but then the detectors. At 77k. So, what temperature are you operating? The whole system. So, when I said warm, is a very relative expression. So, when you talk to Keyside and talk about the other company which gave a talk, there, uh, they will they will probably call this super hot. Uh, so, the whole system <coughs> operates at around 50 or 60 Kelvin. The reason for that is actually a very technical one. Now, now this is all silicon. This is this is all built in silicon. And now the, the thermal conduction of silicon turns out is, is to be fantastic at 50 Kelvin. Now, now we actually developed a process in diamond because diamond is a fantastic thermal conductor. And we realized, okay, if you just cool silicon at 50 Kelvin, then then uh, we win big time. So, so the module, the, the modules themselves. Uh, let me let me show you. Then let me go to the picture of the module. <clears throat> this entire module is is cooled to 50 Kelvin. And, and so we've now installed in the laboratory in Sussex actually a machine which can do exactly this. So what we do is we pump um, helium gas around the lab. So we have a chrysler, and now this is basically a big, big pot, like looks like some, some um, like, like a cooking pot, a massive cooking pot. You have, a, you, have a, you have a chrysler inside this cooking pot, pumps the gas around the lab into all these modules, and it allows us now to, to get everything to around 50 Kelvin, get all this heat away. The cooling power you can get at around 50 Kelvin is quite quite amazing. So the cooling you can get 50, 100, with unbelievably cooling powers, which is what we need here for, for cooling this. Right, so my second question is, can you give me three disadvantages and three advantages of this method comparing to David Lucas's far-field microwave approach? So, so David Lucas doesn't use far-field microwaves. David Lucas uses the near-field microwave approach. Oh, sorry, yeah, so, so in the near-field microwave approach, you apply microwaves to the electrodes. Now, the cool thing about using microwaves is obviously that you have electronics. But what David Lucas does is he has to apply for every entanglement region. He has to buy. He has to go to Keyside and buy a box um, for every set of electrodes. He has to connect all these electrodes um, using microwaves. Uh, so, sorry, he has, he has to have a microwave source for every entanglement region. So here in this new approach, the number of radiation fields required in your quantum computer does not scale with the number of qubits. In David Lucas, it scales exactly linear, linearly with the number of qubits. But that's only one of the hard parts. The other hard part in David Lucas method is that he's, you're going to have to do unbelievably good work in impedance matching. Because if I go ahead and apply microwaves here, what you'll find is that the microwave is going to be here as well. And one of his students, that, that Diana, actually, she made, did some really beautiful work, but it was unbelievably hard to just make sure that by destructive interference, she had to basically make sure that the eye in here doesn't see the microwaves which are applied here. That's really, really hard. So these are the two big differences. First, it doesn't scale. The scaling is, is a, we, our method doesn't scale with a number of qubits. And the second, uh, second, you don't need unbelievably many microwave sources. Third, the impedance matching is going to really be a major pain. 
So we get maybe one more question here. Willie, can you comment on the homogeneity of the microwave fields that you need and whether or not you have to worry about standing mode patterns, reflection, and the evanescent fields? It's a very good question. So, so in, in principle, the, the microwaves do not need to be homogeneous. And the reason why they do not need to be homogeneous is because you will, in your quantum computer, you will, you will spend a lot of time um, doing bookkeeping. So you run calibration operations. So you will basically send ions over here and you let this ion sample the microwave intensity in that in entanglement zone 574 and then you bookkeep it. You know, okay, that's my microwave intensity here. But obviously you're going to run into a problem if you have destructive interference and you have no microwave intensity here. Because, you know, you're going to have the weakest link here, right? So you want to make sure that everywhere on your quantum computer you have a reasonable microwave intensity. And so in practice, it is will, will be very advantageous to think very carefully about destructive interference. And so my the way I'm, our artist impressions of it doesn't reflect this at all. You're absolutely right. There's going to be reflections coming in everywhere, and you're going to have to place your emitter strategically in such a way that 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 doesn't become a massive problem. But say if you have 20% variation, that's absolutely perfectly fine. If you have 50% variation, if you if you can afford a slightly higher power bill, then that's also fine. Okay. Let's uh, thank Woody again.